Okay, hey guys, so my name is Mary. And I'm Amy. And we're here to talk to you about some stroke detections with deep learning. Um, and so a little bit about us. Uh, I am a sophomore right now at Brown studying applied math and computer science. Um, and I'm a junior studying computational biology. And we started working on this program or this project um, with funding from Brown and we got to stay over the summer and work under our PI, Professor Ur Santantimo, who's the chair of the CS department. Um, and we also partnered with Rhode Island Hospital, who is a comprehensive stroke center and they have a lot of stroke data sets. I'm so sorry. That was the timer. <laughs> oh, for the last presentation. cool. No worries. Um, but yeah, Rhode Island Hospital has a lot of stroke data and a lot of um, stroke imaging and CT scans, so that's really where this project got started. And we also worked directly with a lot of the radiologists there, the residents, and also the medical students who gave us like really, really valuable medical expertise. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about strokes before we get started. Um, strokes are a really, really big problem everywhere around the globe, and every year in the U.S. there's around one million new strokes per year, and it's actually the leading cause of long-term disability. And there are many different types of strokes. Some of them involve a bleeding in your brain, but today we're going to focus on a specific subset, and they're called emergent large vessel occlusions, or we're going to call them ELVOs because um, its full name is really a mouthful. And emergent large vessel occlusions happen when one of your main arteries that stem like from your neck, from your heart, to your brain gets clogged, either by plaque or by um, or blood clot or something of the sort. And it's a huge problem because your brain is basically not getting blood, and it's not getting nutrients and your brain cells start dying. And as of right now, only one in four patients with an ELVO are going to be alive and independent at 90 days after their stroke. So it's a pretty big issue, and we tried to see if we can use deep learning to get that number a little bit higher. Um, so as Mary was just saying, um, we're dealing with a pretty high impact, pretty relevant problem. Um, and moreover, this issue is pretty um, unique. Um, in the medical field because uh, recent technological advancements have um, allowed the development of this like method called thrombectomy, um, which enables, which is like a really effective treatment um, for emergent large vessel occlusions. So basically how thrombectomies work is you insert um, a stent um, up like the person's artery um, beyond the location of the occlusion, and it sort of ensnares the clot, and then when you pull out the stent, um, the clot comes out with it, and thereby unclogging the artery, restoring blood flow, and potentially um, saving the person's life. Um, so because of the efficacy of this new treatment, um, there's like a new bottleneck uh, in terms of ad addressing this, this problem. So efficacy is no longer the issue. It, or the efficacy of the treatment is no longer the issue. It's more the efficacy of like the workflow of the hospital, and um, it's more about the new bottleneck is time, basically. Um, and the new goal is to minimize the amount of time spent between um, the patient's arrival at the clinic or the hospital and the amount of time or the time that they can get uh, their thrown back to me and get their treatment. Um, and so this is especially important because a lot of times patients will first present at clinics that don't have, that aren't primary stroke centers. And so there'll be like a dearth of neuroradiologists that are equipped to sort of diagnose these patients. Um, and that's where we come in. Um, that's where uh, the, the problem, the problem is diagnosing things quickly and minimizing door in, door out. Um, so a little bit on the current diagnosis process. So radiologists typically use um, CTA scans to diagnose ELVOs. So that stands for computed tomography angiography. Um, the angiography denotes um, like contrast that's been injected into patients' bloodstreams that highlights the blood flow and allows radiologists to sort of trace that blood flow until the point it cuts off. Um, and then they can sort of say that, that cutoff point is the location of the occlusion. 
And so when I, uh, so CTA scans are 3D images, and by that I mean they're like stacks of 2D images. Um, and so you can sort of see in the visual here, um, each one of those 2D images is like a slice or a level, a plane of the brain. Um, and so radiologists can scroll through each of these planes um, following the highlighted contrast injected vessels until they find that cutoff point. Cool, and um, we didn't really know about this workflow until the radiologist like actually told us about it, and while we were listening to it as CS students, we really boiled down like this diagnosis process into an image classification problem. Because basically radiologists are like looking at these images, they're picking out key features and they're trying to classify these scans as either positive or negative. And so we wanted to see if we can use deep learning to solve that same issue because we know deep learning is really good at like detecting and classifying everyday objects. So we wanted to see if we could apply that to like CT scans and medical images. And so there were really like three main reasons why we wanted to go forth with the project. Um, the first was because we had like a cool opportunity, we had a really cool data set, and we wanted to see what we could do with it. Um, the second is because there isn't really an ELVO detection algorithm out there right now. And finally, like this is a really high impact problem, and for every minute that we like get the patients faster treatment, they could actually get a week more of disability free life. And we think that's like a pretty impactful problem we're solving, and that gave us a lot of motivation going forward. Ooh, this is a really exciting slide. So um, we see some really cool pictures of brains here. And um, one key thing I want to mention is just the asymmetry in all of these images that we see. So if we look at the middle one, you can clearly see that like the left side has a lot more vessel filling. There's a lot more contrast in the right side. And that's basically a pretty key feature of having an occlusion is when like blood flow cuts off, basically the contrast can't get to that portion of your brain, so there's just gray matter. Whereas like on the left side we see like, you know, the contrast flowing through and all the vessel flow, um, all the blood is flowing through the vessels and everything is going well. And if there were a negative case, that means like if someone is healthy and didn't have an elbow, then both sides would have the same amount of vessel filling. And so like while we were looking at these, obviously there are more subtle cases. These are like pretty classic examples of elbows. Um, but there are still really strong features that we thought deep learning models could be really good at learning. And so upon looking at these and looking at the asymmetry, we like wanted to go forward and actually try this out and see if our convolutional neural networks could detect that asymmetry. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, data. Uh, is a really important part of the machine learning de uh, algorithm development process, as many of you probably are aware. Um, so we worked with Rhode Island Hospital um, to and used their data set of roughly 1,200 um, CTA scans. So these were split roughly evenly between positive and negative scans, and all of those um, annual uh, classific classifications were verified by Rhode Island Hospital radiologists. Um, and so um, something to note is that there are different types of elbows um, taking place in different arteries, and those present like somewhat differently, so we wanted to make sure that our data set encompassed um, various types of occlusions and that it wasn't really leaving anything out. So um, the occlusions we considered were internal carotid arterial uh, occlusions, so ICAs, um, occlusions in the uh, middle cerebral arteries, the basilar arteries, and the vertebral arteries. Um, so that's like a lot of just anatomical lingo, but really what that refers to is just arteries sort of like in this like midsection of your brain. Um, and then uh, another thing to note is that the source data that we worked with were 3D DICOM files. So those, uh, the units, um, of the DICOM files are densities, and so they don't necessarily, don't, they don't really correspond to pixel values, so we had to do some pre-processing to get our data into the correct format that we could use in machine learning. Sorry. Um, so speaking of pre-processing, um, as six undergrads with not like a whole lot of experience in machine learning prior to starting this project, we, um, <clears throat> we decided, or, we realized that we needed to use some tools to help us with the project. Um, so here's like a selection of the um, tools that we used. We decided to pick ones that we were either familiar with or that we thought would be relatively straightforward to learn, and we learned a lot. Um, we also used uh, several 
tools that we sort of like made in-house. Um, one of those was um, a manual annotator that allowed us to draw ROI uh, region of interest bounding boxes um, around the locations of elbows in our 3D scans. And um, we'll get to a little, we'll get to why those were useful uh, a little later. Cool, and we're finally getting into the ML deep learning part of things. Um, but basically, the chart is a little small, the text is a little small, but we see two main columns, and those correspond to like the two main techniques that we tried. So we wanted to try like 2D convolutional neural networks, but also 3D CNNs. And for both, we like took the scan, pre-processed them in different ways. We spent like most of our time pre-processing, fed them into different like architectures that we were sort of familiar with, and then plotted the accuracy or ROC values, and we'll get into more details about that in a sec. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the 2D pipeline. Um, this is where we started because we knew there were a lot of like really good 2D like CNNs that were built by researchers out there, like AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, um, et cetera. And we wanted to see if we could leverage that as well as transfer learning to make our accuracy values the best. And the exciting thing here that we did was called MIPPING, and this is a pre-processing strategy that we used in order to convert these 3D files into like 2D images. And MIP stands for Maximum Intensity Projection. For those of you who are familiar with TensorFlow or NumPy, that's kind of like taking an argmax on like the Z axis. So we like take these one millimeter thick slices and we compress them and we take like the maximum value. So we can see like the arterial filling in like a chunk of your brain instead of just like one millimeter slices. Um, yeah, and we took this a little bit further actually. Rather than just doing one chunk, we actually took three adjacent chunks of brain and we assigned each one like an R, a G, or a B value. And so we had this like colorful image that encoded more than like a single chunk could encode. So yeah, we did all of that because we really wanted to capture as much as we could in one single 2D image. And after we pre-processed everything, we fed those into a bunch of different neural networks. We made some of our own CNNs, but obviously those weren't like as good as the ones that like PhDs and postdocs were building. Um, so the one that we found worked the best was ResNet 50, and we tweaked ResNet a little bit by replacing the top layer with three fully connected layers, and that did a little bit better. And we also used an 80-10-10 training validation test split that we randomly generated. And the final thing I want to mention is that like, because we trained a bunch of different neural nets and we trained a bunch of different res nets, we ensembled, so we like averaged the output of the top three models, and that actually got better accuracy than any one model alone. And then some results. So um, we got actually pretty promising results. We got to like a high 80 accuracy value. We got a really good AUC value and we got a really good sensitivity. And we were really excited about the sensitivity score because in like medicine and medical research, sensitivity is really important. And that basically just means that we're not really missing any negative cases. And we wanna make sure everybody who's like potentially positive is like going through with the treatment process. Um, because we really don't wanna miss out any positive cases. And we see on the left here, that's a pretty exciting image. It's just like a colorful blue brain and that's actually what we generated after all of our pre-processing steps are done. And we made that just using like Jupyter Notebook, Python, Matplotlib. And these are actually the scans and the 2D images that we are feeding to train and to test our models. Okay, so um, we verified that our 2D model was or so our 2D model performed pretty successfully. Um, but as always, like there's always room for improvement. So we definitely identified some um, areas in which we could improve upon our 2D model um, that provided us with impetus to explore you know, other, other pipelines. Um, so one of these limitations was that the 2D model um, was a classifier. Um, it was a pretty effective classifier, but um, it could only tell us whether or not like a certain CT scan contained an elbow. It couldn't necessarily tell us where um, said elbow would have occurred, um, which is something that a radiologist could do if they were just looking at it and like tracing through it and finding the elbow location. Um, so along those lines, we thought it would be really great if we could also find a way to somehow localize um, where these occlusions are occurring. Um, the other issue was that because the 2D model relied on this sort of blood flow asymmetry in the CT scans, 
We found that it performed better on certain types of occlusions than others. For example, the M1 occlusions that you saw previously um, with like the green arrows, um, those are pretty textbook examples of emergent large vessel occlusions and the asymmetry is very apparent. But in other types of occlusions, like basilar occlusions, for example, um, just like physiologically, it just doesn't show as much um, asymmetry just because of like where the artery is. Um, so, because of these issues, um, we decided to start pursuing a 3D pipeline as well. So the premise of this pipeline was that we could, we thought we could split each large uh, 3D CT scan or CTA scan into a set of smaller um, standardized cubes and then pass these cubes in as input into our models instead of um, the large scans themselves. So. Um, Basically, so there's like a graphic here, but what we did was we drew um, bounding boxes around, uh, we manually annotated all of our positive scans by drawing ROI bounding boxes around the region of, or the region of interest, the region in which the occlusion took place. And then using that data, we labeled, we split each of our scans into like these sets of like, smaller cubes and then labeled each cube as either elbow positive or elbow negative, <clears throat> depending on whether or not the occlusion occurred within like the smaller cube. Um, and then we uh, experimented with um, using trained uh, 3D CNNs to take in that sort of smaller cube data and to determine whether or not the occlusion took place within a small, uh, within the smaller cube or not. So that's sort of like relying on less on asymmetry um, in the overall brain and more on just the actual like cutoff and blood flow that occurs um, when an occlusion, when and where an occlusion occurs. So our ultimate goal with this pipeline would be to pinpoint elbow location. Um, and we, so this, this pipeline is very much still an ongoing project, so we don't have like very concrete results yet. Um, but ultimately, like long term, we would want to make some sort of locational elbow identifier. And we were thinking it would take like the form of like a heat map, like the one shown here, in which you could just flag cubes of the brain that had higher probabilities um, of elbow occurrence. So. Um, in the image, you can see sort of the cutoff and blood flow, the green arrow points to it on the left, um, and then in the corresponding, in the heat map, that region would have a, like, a redder value um, indicating, you know, higher probability of there being an elbow. So um, applying machine learning to 3D images is like definitely a novel approach, and we're definitely still pursuing this pipeline. <clears throat> So I just want to end off with some future directions for our group and what's happened since we got these results. Um, so we presented something really similarly to Rhode Island Hospital a couple weeks ago and all the radiologists were super excited. And I think they just thought like AI and deep learning was like really cool. Um, even though we think like what they do is a little cooler. But anyways, um, we, we presented it to them and they were happy to like give us more data and continue working with us. And we also got a couple new grad students working with us, so it's really nice to have their expertise and have them on the team. Um, last week, we actually got a lot of new data coming in, so that's like also really exciting and hopefully that'll make our accuracy better. And we also just wanna continue improving ResNet, continue trying other models, see if we can get that a little bit better. Um, ultimately, if we want to apply this clinically, we're going to have to compare what our model is getting with like radiologist performance in real time. And the ultimate goal remains the same. Like we just want to improve this workflow and we want to make sure everybody who can benefit from thrombectomy is getting the treatment in time. And I was talking to Dr. McTagger a couple weeks ago and he was saying how what we're doing now is really cool because it could potentially be applied to other types of brain diseases as well. So we're talking about like hemorrhages or herniation or hydrocephalus. Like there are many problems that the same or a very similar pipeline could solve. And at the end of the day, like our long, long term plan would be to try to create a fully automated neural imaging package. And that would be like based on deep learning and that would be very novel in its field. And we think it'd be super cool. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you. 
to a region of the brain. Um, because, oh, because everything was like, um, the brain was actually pretty small in the image, we actually trained the model to detect brain matter rather than to detect like the occlusion. So it was just like, we trained a model that was super good at detecting where the brain was, um, which isn't exactly the problem we were trying to solve. But yeah, so we don't actually have like a number for you right now just because we still haven't figured out how to like actually get the model to train for the occlusion, if that makes sense. So we use the exact same images for 2D and 3D, um, but the 3D, because we make them into smaller cubes, we actually have a lot more like, yeah, so it's like the same data set except like 2D, we have like each patient just has, you know, is corresponding to one input, whereas like for the 3D, each patient's image is like sliced into so many cubes, so it's corresponding to like, you know, hundreds of inputs. So we actually do have a lot more 3D data, but the 3D data is very unbalanced because there's so much negative space, so we have a lot more negatives and very few positives, whereas for the 2D, it's relatively balanced, and we think that could also be why it's like not doing as well. Yeah. Yes. That is a great question. I think they were like, oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just <laughs> getting sick. Um, um, I think they were like, like what, like 500 by 600 by, mm, yeah. Like the the thing is, we also resized them. Oh, I'm not, I'm not like entirely sure. Like, 500 by 500. like in the hundreds on each yeah. axis. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so at first we wanted to just take like a single slice, um, but because like patients are different heights and like each slice, like the same numbered slice, like slice 248, like for patient A and patient B will be corresponding to very different areas in their brain. So that didn't work very well. Um, and also the slices that come out like from the CT scanner are like one millimeter thick. So like imagine taking like a one millimeter chunk of your brain, like you don't actually get to see a lot of like what's going on. You only get to see like that one really thin region. Um, we got the idea of MIPS because that's actually what some of the radiologists look at as well. They like don't have time to scroll through all of the images, so they just look through like MIPS images. Um, and so that's where we got the idea. We tried our models with single channel MIPS, so like just MIPing one section and using a grayscale value. Um, and then we also tried it with like the three channels with like different colors and different areas. And the second one did better. And like within that, we tweaked a lot about like how thick we're mipping and like what region we're taking. Um, played around with that a lot, and that was what we ended up with. But if you have any ideas, like let me know. Yeah. Anyone else? Think. Oh yes. So it sounds like you, I'm kind of curious about the process of uh, interacting with hospital and then working on a large team. It's like you can talk about whatever you want. But some questions might be, um, how, how did you parallelize a larger team of people working on the same project? Um, any tips there? And then also, give me tips for interacting with a group of doctors who don't necessarily know each other. I think for us, it, did, it helped to have like a liaison, I guess, of sorts. So um, we, we had like one or two um, members of like the hospital side of things who would regularly come and sit in on our meetings and try to keep up um, with what was going on on the ML side and who like really actively tried to learn like at least like the basics of ML um, and what we were doing. Um, and I think in terms of parallelizing it like getting data is like a lengthy process especially when it's like medical data and it's like mm -hmm. private and there are like yeah. a lot of necessary security measures um, so I think like the the team at the hospital like really took like lead on that front um, and we're spending like a lot of time doing that just as we were spending like a lot of time like doing our ML training. Yeah, and for like working in a team, I think 
for us, um, the first few weeks was just about learning. So it was kind of just like learning in a group and that was helpful because we were like building off ideas off each other and some people like different people on the team had taken different courses, you know, so it was nice to share that knowledge. Um, I think it's really important to like divide tasks for each person. So towards the end of the project, we had kind of like two small sub teams going where like three of us were doing model training and like the deep learning, machine learning, tweaking those. And um, the other three people were building more like infrastructure support, right? Like how can we map our results better using Kibana, Elasticsearch, things like that. And they were building more of like the support pipeline. Um, and that worked out like a lot better than just having like six people doing random things. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you.